Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the second session of our spring colloquium on faith and science. Um, uh, just to give you a preview for next week, so don't forget at the end, uh, Dr. Frederick Christian Bauerschmidt, otherwise known as Deacon Fritz around these parts, um, will be giving us a lecture on Galileo, Darwin, and Catholic theology. So he'll be uh, looking at the scientific controversies of, of the Renaissance and, and after and how Catholic theology has sought to square the questions that science poses to faith. This evening we have Dr. Megan Latshaw with us. Dr. Latshaw is the director of the master's degree program in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering at the Johns Hopkins University. She also serves as co-chair of the University's Sustainability Plan Steering Committee and as core faculty for the environmental challenges focus area of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative. <clears throat> as faculty at Hopkins, her efforts focus on designing healthy communities, connecting environmental health research with the real world, climate and transportation, all through a justice and, and, equ and equity lens. Here at the parish, Megan is a lector almost every other week at the 930 Mass, it seems, and her daughter Scout is one of our altar servers and MCs. They're longtime parishioners of our cathedral. So thank you for being here with us, Megan, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. It's so exciting to be here. Yay. Don't applaud yet. You haven't heard me talk. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm really excited to be here to talk a little bit um, about my field, environmental health, but more specifically about environmental justice. So. Um, does anybody recognize this map? We show it all the time at the School of Public Health. So I kind of feel like, um, you know, I always don't want to repeat, but some people didn't say yes. So I'm going to start off actually, before I talk about this map, with a little bit of history. So going back to the early 1900s, in, nine, in the 1910s, um, the U.S. was flush with cash. We were the richest nation in the world, and in part, it was because of these massive corporations that were selling goods all over the world. So we have a lot of money, and we're doing great, and one of the things that um, Baltimore um, did during this time is they passed the first ordinance on racial zoning. Now, the 1920s come along, and um, you know everybody is uh, buying cars, and so now they can move about a lot easier, and everybody is also buying houses. So there was sort of a flight out of the city, because now cars gave people freedom, and they wanted to live in houses with backyards, and you know it was sort of this American dream. Um, and it was also during the 1920s um, that there was this thing called white flight out of cities um, because the people who had more money um, were, were able to move. And the places that they moved drew up covenants that said things like Jews and Catholics and blacks can't live here. Um, and literally, it said that on the paper. In fact, when I moved into Homeland, I live uh, across the street, when we bought our house, the covenant still had that language in it. It no longer does, um, but I crossed it out when we signed it, because I, I didn't, my husband's like, I can't believe you even read this. Um, but I read it and uh, crossed that out. Um, so um, during the 30s, the Great Depression, so everything changed, right? Um, during that time, the Housing Authority of Baltimore City um, was trying to help people find places to live, but they ran two separate programs. They had a program for white families and a program for black families. Um, and then is that's sort of when we come to this map. So this map was drawn up by the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which was a semi-federal government uh, agency, semi-private, semi-governmental, and they drew this map in 1937, and this map is where the term redlining comes from. I see a lot of heads nodding. So um, the red areas were majority black, and those were the areas that were considered risky for investment, and so it was very difficult to buy there unless you were black. Um, and so um, 
that is uh, sort of a little bit of history of Baltimore. Um, I, you're probably wondering, okay, you know, Father Goff said this person works at the School of Public Health. Like, why am I talking about housing if, if I work at the School of Public Health? So the reason is because of these racist policies, we still see today impacts on health. Um, so racism in and of itself, um, there was a, a systematic review where you look at tons of other studies. So almost 300 studies on racism. And these 300 studies pretty much all agree that racism has negative effects on your mental health. Surprise, surprise, right? You feel like people are racist and you're the target of it, you're gonna be a little depressed. You're gonna have anxiety. You're gonna have stress. Um, and it also impacts your general health and your physical health. Interestingly enough, if you control for education, this effect doesn't go away. So even if you have the same education level, um, the, there is still an impact of racism on your health. Or even if you were born in the same place, you still see this impact of racism on health. Um, this map is the average life expectancy in Baltimore from 2016. Does it look vaguely familiar? See those red areas on this map? So we're still seeing the impacts today. Um, and um, if you haven't heard the term, the black butterfly, um, that is sort of, uh, and the white L. Um, let me see, can I use my pointer? I think I can. So down the middle is the people who live the longest, and it looks like an L, and that's where mostly whites live. And then these little butterfly wings to the right and left, east and west Baltimore, um, are the where people live the shortest, and that's where most, it's majority black. Um, and so even in 2016, we still see this history of segregation, that also still impacts health today. So to put like a little bit of um, more specifics on this, uh, this is downtown Seton Hill. And your average, if you were born in 2016, your average life expectancy if you lived there was 63 years old. In contrast to if you were born um, in Roland Park, um, which is less than five miles away, your average life expectancy would be 83. 20 years difference. So what we say in public health, which still shocks me, I've been hearing this for probably 10 years now, your zip code is a better predictor of how long you'll live and how healthy you are than your genetic code is. And so the question is, how does this happen? You know, um, and so there's, there's a cycle. I'm gonna start up in the top um, corner right here. So if you think about redlining, way back in the day, what happened is those communities that were redlined, they didn't have as good of schools, right? And so they had limited education, and limited education led to limited job opportunities. And limited job opportunities led to limited income. So then, because of all these factors, then you get into the residential options. And also, if you think about it, too, they couldn't get loans to buy. Even today, the average price for a house in one of the red line neighborhoods is $50,000 less than the same size and style house in one of the non-red line neighborhoods. So even if somebody in one of these neighborhoods said, I want to move to, to Roland Park, they can't just sell their house and move to Roland Park. And if they do, if they give their house to their children, the wealth is not as high. And so it, it sort of widens this wealth gap. Um, and so they have limited choice of residential options. They can't move out, it's hard to move out. Um, they also have limited infrastructure um, and limited services. But then if you think about this too, they have limited access to credit. So even today, in red line neighborhoods, there's not that many banks. What you see instead are payday loan centers or um, pawn shops. So if you need money, that's what you do. You don't go, um, uh, somebody that I follow on uh, social media was, I guess, in Roland Park by Eddie's, and he's like, do you realize there's five banks in one block? 
He's like, not in my neighborhood. <laughs> so even, so if you live here and you have limited housing choice, you probably live in an older home and you probably can't afford to keep it up because you can't get loans to put a new roof on or you know do whatever you need to do. And so um, what ends up happening is these adverse environmental factors. So lead paint is not remediated. Um, you probably have more mold issues. Um, in fact, you do have more mold issues. It's, it's been studied. Um, you have more roaches and mice and things that cause asthma. And so now we're starting to see on this circle the health risk factors that are all related to this cycle. So you have lead poisoning, which leads to um, uh, decreased IQ. So then that, again, just goes back through the cycle of limited education, limited employment opportunities. Um, it also leads to ADHD. Um, it leads to death, lead poisoning. Um, Freddie Gray was lead poisoned as a child. Um, and there's also been linkages to crime, too, um, alongside lead. And then um, there's asthma, too. I, I mentioned mold and cockroaches and mice. These are all asthma triggers. In fact, in 2010, in Baltimore City, there were t its uh, asthma hospitalization rates were twice as high um, than the rest of the state. And I'm getting ahead of myself. There were some other statistics that I had written down. Not about this, though. Um, all right, so I just gave you some I think pretty staggering numbers around life expectancy, 63 versus 83. Um, but the focus of my talk is really about environmental justice. So I'm gonna, let's, let's talk a little bit about numbers related to the environment. So first I'm gonna start off with a fact. Race is the most significant predictor of a person living near contaminated air, water, or soil. It's a fact. Um, what do you guys think? I, I covered up some of these numbers. We'll do a pop quiz. My students love when I do pop quizzes. All right, so what percent of the population near toxic waste sites do you think are people of color? How about like 20%? Um, no, 40%, 60%, 80%. All right, you guys are good. Um, let me see, oh, it didn't work. Okay, so I'm gonna have to tell you what the numbers are. Um, so it's 56%. So you guys were a little bit more pessimistic, so that's good. It's better than what you thought, right? So how about um, this one? Um, how many people of color have seen their claims against polluters denied by the EPA? 20%, 40, 60, 80. It's 95%. Isn't that high? I didn't go to 100 because I just thought oh, they'll never buy that. But it's pretty close. You would round up 100% of people of color who filed against a polluter with EPA have been denied. Um, this is uh, nitrogen dioxide. It's, it's a, it's a pollution, uh, air pollutant. Um, people of color have 38% higher exposure to nitrogen dioxide, and then um, people of color are more likely to live without potable water and modern sanitation, twice as likely. Potable water, this is the United States of America. Now the number itself is pretty low, so um, I don't wanna like play with statistics, but on average, people of color make up 56% of the population living in neighborhoods that have toxic release facilities. 56% of the population, whereas they only make up the population 30% other, other places. Um, African Americans are more than 75% likely than whites to live near fence line communities, 75%. So these numbers, I think, are, are staggering. Um, I'm gonna switch a little bit. Um, you know, we talked about the numbers, and now I wanna talk about the, hum the humans <laughs> behind the numbers, because that's, I mean, that's what we care about, right? Humanity. Um, 
So this is Miss Cynthia Shaw. Um, I have the pleasure of working with her, um, not as often as I might like. Um, she's the president of the Lindhurst Community Association, which is in Edmondson Village here in Baltimore. And she worked for over 15 years to bring the red line to Baltimore City. You guys heard of the red line? Yeah, okay. It didn't come, <laughs> no. You're giving away my story. <laughs> um, so do you know what, do you know the story of why it didn't come or anybody? Yeah, you wanna? Racism. <laughs> racism, good guess. There's a theme here, right? Well, it would enable the blacks to get out of the city. Yes, so, so the there are people who go to meetings about transportation and they say they're gonna come and steal our televisions and then get back on the bus or get back on the train and take them you know, home, which I've never seen anybody carrying a television on public transit, um, but people are really afraid. I mean, change is tough. Statistics are, you know, are true. Um, so what happened is uh, the MTA spent nearly $300 million just planning for the red line and designing it and getting the environmental impact you know, approval and everything. There was so much hope for it. It was gonna make Baltimore a smart, sophisticated city. It was gonna connect East Baltimore and West Baltimore, the two butterfly pieces. It was gonna connect people in West Baltimore to jobs at um, Hopkins Bayview. Um, and now there's an Amazon place over um, in East Baltimore too that, that uh, could have been connected. In this article, it said there would be a windfall of jobs, development, and environmental sustainability, especially for some of the city's black neighborhoods. Now, besides jobs and development and environmental sustainability, what else do you think transit would do for these communities? Public transit, like a light rail. Reduce pollution, yeah. Access. access to healthy food, what did you say, Louise? Access to health care, yep, mm-hmm, yep. So access to health care, access to healthy food. How about access to jobs, too? So not just would it create jobs, but it could get people to their jobs. So 80% um, of people in Baltimore City who ride public transit takes 90 minutes for them to get to work. If they drove, it would take them 20 minutes. And a lot of the people in Baltimore City who do take public transit, they have to um, transfer. Now the MTA says if a bus is less than eight minutes late, that's on time. <laughs> but when you miss your transfer because your first bus is late and then you show up to work late, in Baltimore, a lot of jobs for like essential workers, like during the pandemic, they have a three strikes and you're out policy. So you're late three times and you're done. So access to jobs is a really important thing for public transit. Access to health care. Um, I'm about to get to another thing that it, that it offers access to um, in a minute. Um, I don't want to, but education is another thing too. So in 2015, um, right after Freddie Gray's death, Governor Larry Hogan canceled the the $2.9 billion plan, and he sent back to the federal government $900 million and said, we don't want it, $900 million. And then took the $736 million that had been set aside by the state and put that toward widening highways in the surrounding counties, which are mostly white. Um, and, um, so while there are wider roads on the Eastern Shore and outside DC, Baltimore City is the only jurisdiction in the state that relies on mass transit to shuttle students to school. So you don't see a lot of yellow buses in Baltimore City. And that's because middle and high school students, public school students are expected to take public transit. And so there was a study um, done by, uh, what was it called? The Fund for Educational Excellence, and they talked to students who took public transit. One student said he was late to class three times a week. 
Another student said he was late 23 times in one term, which was basically half the days. Um, female students said that they were harassed on the buses, that they couldn't do their hair or their makeup because people would come and sit down next to them and get in their face. Um, two students told them that they had been robbed of their cell phones while waiting for the bus to go to school. Um, some people mentioned seeing fights, people doing drugs. These are our children that we're hoping are gonna go on and do great things with their lives. And we're traumatizing them and we're denying them access to education, which is supposed to be what's gonna lift you up out of this, right? So again, this is that first picture. This time I want you to pay more attention to what she's holding in her hands. So Ms. Shaw still has photos. She went in 2008 to a on a trip to Portland, Oregon. And um, she and a group of Baltimoreans boarded a light rail and she was so excited. She said it was like so smooth and um, she still has, there's a spiral bound book in the middle. It's her vision plan. So her and all her neighbors got together and said, if we get this stop in our neighborhood, it's gonna lead to all this development. It's gonna lead to um, places to eat. And you know, so transit, when you have buses, nobody builds around a bus stop. But if you have light rail, things pop up. Residential um, housing pops up, uh, grocery stores pop up. Um, all sorts of development occurs. It's actually a term for it. It's called transit-oriented development, or TOD. Um, and so they had this, this big, um, you know, all these hopes and all these plans. And um, here she is. She's talking about the cancellation. She says, it was mind-boggling. I couldn't believe it was happening. And we still, to this day, as Marylanders, we still pay the increased gas tax um, that was supposed to cover the red line. Um, but... Ms. Shaw and, and Baltimore City school students are still waiting for the bus. Um, so Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition filed a federal complaint saying that this violated the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, the Trump administration dismissed the complaint, um, didn't, no, didn't issue any public findings, um, but Governor Moore um, did promise to build the red line um, during his tenure, so that's pretty short to build a red line. So we'll see. He hasn't made any move to do it. So, you know, uh, we'll see if it happens. But there's also a lot of federal funding coming in um, for to connect the east and west um, parts of Baltimore. But there also is talk of just doing more bus lines. And um, buses are not quite as good as public transit. So going back to the first slide. Yeah, do you have a question? Uh, is it like a, um, a light rail? Yes, it's a light rail. So the red line would have been a light rail. Mm -hmm. So there's the one that runs north south, and then this one would have run east west. Sounds a little similar to like what's going on with Hills Road. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's a totally different area. Totally different area. So what's going on with York Road? Do you want to give a little? Oh, I mean, in a way, it's kind of. And you stop me. Yeah. I understand. It's you know, it's the same issues at heart. Is like how do you get all you know people from one end of. I guess like, you know, one end of York Road to, I guess mm -hmm. all the way downtown. Yeah. And there's, what's a solution for that? Because the metro doesn't work and light rail doesn't work all yeah. that great for mm -hmm. that. So a uh, lot of traffic on York Road. And so they proposed putting in um, public transit, like a, a light rail yeah, type. like five different options. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry? Where, where, yeah, where would they put it? Well, that's what <laughs> Yeah, uh-huh. That's okay. Yeah, in the back. As much as I'm for public transportation. Yeah. And uh, uh, I believe that we should have a way of connecting the east side to the west side of Baltimore. One of the flaws with, with uh, putting the red line in, I feel, uh, is that it is almost like a, it is almost like installing a bus on rails. And so you mm -hmm. have to have it stop at every single intersection. If you look at map that you had earlier, it almost stops at every single intersection. So um, it is better than having nothing. Um, I agree with that, but you know, it's just too bad that we can't get a decent subway system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Subway would be great. Um, I think, I don't know for sure. Yeah. Something that wouldn't have to stop at intersections, kind of like the light rail that goes to Camden Yards, right? Yeah. Sh yeah, uh-huh. Well, one of the only large cities that has nothing. 
Yeah, if you and yeah, and we're so close. Like DC and, and Baltimore used to be very similar, but part of why you know DC is flourishing is it's so easy to get around. Um, part of there's a lot of other reasons, but you know you could. One of the things that Baltimore is doing is now like buses have the right of way and they have their own separate lanes in the city, which is interesting because there's a lot of neighborhoods that were intended to benefit from the buses having their own lanes. And the neighborhoods are really angry about it because they weren't consulted and they weren't part of it. And so now they're like, we don't have our parking spots, mm -hmm. um, you know? And so they're complaining and they want to get rid of the bus lanes. But you could sort of say like the light rail has the right of way. So anytime the light rail is coming through, all the cars have to stop. So as much as it makes people hate me, you know, one of the things that I, you know, would love to see is us, you know, make having a car difficult. Um, so that the easier choice would be to walk or to bike or to take public transit. Um, you know, I proposed... One of, the uh, um, things, one of the best things they did, I think, recently in Baltimore is one of the three bus lines, the purple line. Yes. Mm -hmm. I agree, yeah. So I'm on the sustainability um, planning committee for Johns Hopkins. And um, one of my proposals was to really increase parking costs, which I park there. I'm like, I don't know why I did that. Well, I do know why I did that. Um, but it got you know shot down really quickly. But what they did agree to do is to subsidize uh, public transit passes for all students, staff, and faculty. Um, it still has to go to the Board of Trustees, so I don't know if it'll come all the way through. But if everybody at Hopkins had free, pa not free passes, but subsidized passes, all of a sudden ridership would go way up, money coming into the system would go way up, and Hopkins would probably have some power to say to MTA, like, you need to clean up your act. Like, you know, we need more investments. So, yeah. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm totally in favor of mass transit. Yeah. My company makes parts for the awesome. Marsh Washington Metro. Yeah. And they're well written. But the financial projections here, from what I've seen, yeah. have been terrible for the red line, for others. And when I look at their light rail, it's empty most of the time. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder why our city isn't bringing business into the city yeah. and tearing down all those old buildings and bringing businesses using mm -hmm. the port, using the rail, mm -hmm. and, and all the communications aspects we have, yeah. and bringing jobs here yeah. instead of saying, let's build another system yeah. that costs the taxpayer more and more money mm -hmm. that drives business out. <laughs> so generally what, what the research has shown is that if you have good public transit, businesses are going to want to come. Um, but I understand what you're saying, which comes first, the businesses who demand the good public transit or the good public transit who bring the businesses? Going back to the industrial bottom, yeah. we had all these jobs here. Yeah. We've driven them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd like to see our governor, our mayor, and all of our politicians going out promoting and bringing business in. I agree. And lowering taxes instead of figuring out how to spend more money to provide free transport. Well, so the point of today is to talk about faith and science, right? And so um, when I wrap up, I'm going to talk about, you know, the people who don't have access to health care and the people who don't have access to healthy food the people who don't have access to education. education. Yeah, and jobs so, education. yeah, so if we say to them, well, we're gonna bring in jobs to the city, that's not gonna help them get to their doctor's appointment right away. And so I think, you know, it's, I think we can do ever. I think we can do it all. I'm Susie Sunshine um, and probably naive, but um, I think we have to set our, our goals high and, and do everything. So I think we could do transit and more economic development at the same time. All right, so we started off with numbers. We covered the human side of the topic, but we haven't really talked about the pollution piece. Transportation itself is responsible for over 55% uh, percent of nitro nitrogen or um, NOx pollution, um, which are sorts of different, di a bunch of different chemicals. Um, there's two other pollutants here, but it also doesn't, this slide doesn't mention, this is from the EPA, um, that transportation is the single largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So it beats fossil fuel burning. Um, I'm sorry, beats power plants. Yep. Yes, exactly. Yes. 
Um, thank you. Yeah, because you're burning fossil fuels in the vehicles too. Um, and EPA estimates that if we implement vehicle um, emissions uh, targets, that we could prevent 40,000 premature deaths, 34,000 avoided hospitalizations, and 4.8 million work days lost. Um, so that brings up the question, what sorts of vehicles do you think contribute the most to pollution in Baltimore? No, not buses. Because there's so many people on it, ideally, there's so many people on a bus that if all those people were driving their own vehicles, yeah. So it's generally, I mean, you, you could also argue that some of the, um, you know, like cargo, like, you know, big tractor trailers are doing a lot of it and also some of the big ships to contribute a lot. But um, when you think about passenger vehicles, um, what type of people do you think are mostly driving into the city? People who live where? In the suburbs. Um, and who's breathing the pollution that these cars are bringing into the city? The city dwellers, right? So this is, this is where like the environmental justice issue comes in. Um, this was an interesting study that found that whites experience 17% less air pollution than we produce. Whereas blacks and Hispanics bear the burden of 56 and 63% more air pollution than they produce. So as whites, we're producing the pollution um, and we're not really experiencing the impact of it. Um, and if you think from a global scale, greenhouse gases are very much the same. So the title of this talk was uh, environmental justice. Um, and so I, of course, I have to define it being a, a, a professor. So um, environmental justice, according to EPA, is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people. Sounds sort of like social justice, doesn't it? Very Catholic thing, uh, very Christian thing. Um, and this fair treatment and meaningful involvement is regardless of race, color, origin, or income. And it is respect, it's with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. The fair treatment piece of that, people haven't heard that term before. So fair treatment means that no group of people should bear a disproportionate share of the negative environmental consequences um, resulting from industrial, governmental, commercial operations or policies. And the meaningful involvement piece of the EJ definition is that people can participate in decisions about activities that affect their environment or their health that the public's contribution can influence the regulatory agency's action, that their concerns will be considered in the decision-making process. So in other words, they don't just send their concerns in and they you know, disappear. They actually have to be considered and responded to. And that the decision-makers seek out and facilitate the involvement of those affected. So I mentioned like, you know, these new bus lanes came in and the communities were angry because they hadn't been consulted. So that wasn't meaningful involvement. Um, so you have to actually seek out the people that you're gonna impact. So environmental racism is when you have racial discrimination in environmental policy making, sort of like that redlining. And it results in the deliberate and disproportionate exposure of racial and ethnic minorities. And um, these conditions include close residential proximity to toxic sites, to pollutants in air, water, soil, incinerators, landfills, and it has an adverse impact on the health and well-being of those people. It also is the systematic exclusion of minorities um, from participating in the determination of remedies and enforcement of laws. So this is like, I, you know, it's funny, I feel like I seem like I like history, but I hated history growing up. Um, but it's interesting because um, environmental justice is really like the coming together of like the social justice movement and also the civil rights movement. In fact, this is a picture of Martin Luther King um, with some clergy. Um, and um, this was in 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee. He was uh, striking with DPW workers, so Department of Public Works. Um, the DPW had refused to take trucks that were dilapidated, that were, you know, about to 
you know, just fall, break down out of service. And they wouldn't pay overtime, even though the workers were working overtime and working late night shifts. So the sanitation workers at the time, they earned so, their wages were so low that most of them were on welfare and had to use food stamps to pay to feed their family. So MLK went down there, this picture was taken, and the next day he was shot and killed. Um, so it's just interesting that he was involved in the environmental justice movement. Most people don't know that. This is from uh, less than 20 years later, 1982. It's from Warren County, North Carolina. Um, it's a predominantly African-American community, and um, they formed the community when the slaves were freed. They sort of formed this um, little community, so they traced their roots way back to, in the history of the U.S. Well, their community was designated to be a hazardous waste landfill site for this um, soil that had been sprayed along the side of the road and was contaminated with PCBs. And um, the NAACP said, this isn't right, this community doesn't want this hazardous waste here, and so they staged this protest. 500 people were arrested, including uh, Dr. Benjamin Chavis, um, who was part of the United Church of Christ. Um, and um, unfortunately, it was not successful. They did build the landfill in Warren County. But this is just to show you that convergence of the civil rights movement um, and um, environmental justice. So this is five years after that. This is a United Church of Christ um, study called Toxic Waste and Race. And um, they basically looked at how the two things were related and they concluded that race was the most significant factor in citing hazardous waste facilities. Three out of every five African Americans lived in this area in a community housing toxic waste sites which was staggering because African Americans only made up 20% of the population in that region. So three out of every five lived near a toxic waste site, but they only made up 20% of the population. So um, I mentioned Dr. Ben Chavis of the United Church of Christ, um, and this is uh, Charles Lee who gave me a lot of these slides, um, who now, he works at EPA's Office of Environmental Justice. A few years after that, there was the National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit in Washington. Um, that was 1991. In 2021, we just celebrated the 30-year anniversary of this. It was really an inspirational day. Um, we have come a long way. Sometimes I feel like I'm negative, you know, and but we really are. We're getting there. We're making progress. We're addressing these issues. Um, in fact, in 1993, so two years later, under President H. W. George H. W. Bush. Um, the EPA created the National Environmental Justice Advisory Committee, um, or council, um, and that had representatives from industry, as well as grassroots organizations, academia, business. A few years later, President Clinton signed an executive order on the subject. Um, President Biden just signed an executive order on the subject. So how are we doing now? Well, this graph from 2006 shows not that great. Um, if you look at, so this is um, cancer risk along the left, and this is how segregated communities are. So in low segregated communities, everybody has the same cancer risk. See all those dots overlap? In highly segregated communities, <laughs> you see that the, the cancer risk is very different based on your race. And so it shows that segregation does have an impact on health. Um, so we still have a way to go. Um, I asked previously, how does this happen? But what I really want to ask is, what can we do about it? Um, so we have to look at people through a trauma-informed lens. If you haven't heard, this is like a new jargony term, but I really love it. Um, and instead of saying, what's wrong with you? Why didn't you do well in school? Why didn't you pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get a good job? Why did? What's wrong with you? What we really need to ask is what happened to you? Where were you born? Were you exposed to lead? Were you taking public transit and couldn't get to school on time? What happened to you? And how might we help? And then the very last question where we want to get at the end of the day is how might you use your story 
to change the system and make the world a better place, not just for yourself, but for others. So that's a trauma-informed lens. It's, it's sort of um, thinking about people's trauma. Um, and this is one of my favorite slides. I'm almost done. Um, it shows the differences between equality, equity, and justice. So equality assumes everyone benefits from the same support. So they all have the same crate. But the short person is really struggling. That's not going to work. So equality didn't work for this situation. Equity means everybody gets the support they need. So now the short person has two crates. The tall person has none. But they can all see. So that's a little bit better, right? But the justice picture is all three can see the game without support. So we changed the system so that nobody you know, needed to have any crates to be able to see the game. So that's sort of what we're working toward is this justice approach. So, you know, this is all about science and faith, right? How does faith come into it? So um, I love, my daughter goes to friends next door and they say, uh, the Quakers say, there's that of God in each of us, which I think is a way of saying we're all created in God's image. And so um, sometimes when I meet somebody that I think is a little grouchy, I try to like remind myself there's God in this person, and it usually works. And I'm usually able to understand, you know, maybe they're grouchy because they, you know, they're having a bad day or whatever. Um, but you know, when you see these kids who are trying to get to school on time and they're being harassed or being robbed on public transit, you have to see God in that person, right? Am I my brother's keeper? You know, the going back to Cain and Abel. Um, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters, you did to me. So are we doing anything to help the people in our city? Um, or are we walking by like the three people that passed the man on the road before the Good Samaritan came along and helped him? And are we, you know, like the rich man walking by Lazarus? Um, so those are some of the, you know, the pieces of faith that I think drive me to do what I do. And then what can you do? Because this is my job. I get to do this every day. Um, you can educate yourself and others. So these are some books that you can read about the black butterfly. Um, oh, and I got that wrong. So Not in My Neighborhood was written by Ant Antero Piatella, um, whereas the other Westmore was written by Westmore. Um, and um, Shelter was written by one of my neighbors who teaches at Hopkins, um, A Black Tale of Homeland. You can also support organizations that are working to fight environmental injustice. South Baltimore Community Land Trust is an example, the Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition, No Boundaries Coalition, the Union of Concerned Scientists works at the national level. And because I work at Hopkins, we just got this big grant to work on environmental justice. Um, and that's called Charmed. You can volunteer with these groups. You can participate. You can write to policymakers to increase access to better housing. Um, you know, one of the interesting stories um, or studies was if you move kids from a low-income community to a higher-income community, they have better, they, they end up with better, not only better health, but better, um, more college, they go, they go to college more, they end up in better jobs with higher incomes. Um, and so moving kids to better neighborhoods is good, but what often happens? The neighborhoods fight it. They say, I don't want Section 8 housing in my neighborhood. So that goes back to that book called Not In My, not in my Neighborhood, right? You can do all these great things, but not in my neighborhood. Don't move them to where I live. And transit, you know? You can take public transit. You can support the system and, and, and put money into it. Um, education, you know, um, we need a lot of investments in education. We do invest a lot in education, but I, you know, anyway. Um, you can think about your choices. Is it us versus them? So if the transit's coming up York Road and you live in the county and you're worried what kind of people is that gonna bring into my neighborhood? That's an us versus them attitude. And I'm on Hopkins' back because I'm always telling them, we have our own separate transit system. Mm -hmm. That creates an us versus them. You know, and you're saying you want to be part of Baltimore, and you are part of Baltimore. Well, then we need to improve the public transit system enough that Hopkins will want to use it for our students, staff, and faculty. Um, 
And so, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's not just about writing checks, but it's about reversing a system that is built up over decades. Um, and that's going to take time. But as I said, we're moving in the right direction. So I want to end on that positive note um, and also um, acknowledge some of these slides that I borrowed from my colleagues, Dr. Heaney and Dr. Smith and Charles.